Hello, I am Katrick and today I'm making this video for the Construct2 Academy. The project we are going to work with today is about isometric rendering. We do have a main character that is currently moving, the brown thingy. Enemies characters, the zombies, which are flashing right now. The flash means that they are aggroed, so they have been in range, in line of sight view of the main character and are currently following it. The main character is moving into an isometric grid and as you can see can't move across obstacles. It would go behind and in front according to the depth. We do have several views available to us and several possibilities. In the current view I can use the arrow keys to move my camera around and I use the numeric keypad to move the main character. You can notice on the left a grid and if I press the V key to change the view I'm in grid mode only because actually this is a grid that determines the type of terrain to render, the character's positions and so on. And here is a strictly isometric view where the camera is focusing and following my character. For the current video, we are going to focus on the terrain rendering. The idea here is to create a 2D grid that will allow us to handle the type of terrain to display. The obstacles encountered on this terrain having characters navigate through this terrain. Also, some AI for the enemies, making them able to take aggro, follow the player's character when at correct range. The 2D grid allows us to use construct to behaviors like line of sight and path finding in a very simple way since they are intended to be used in a basic 2D environment with X and Y axis. The grid also relies on its own logic coordinate system that we will greatly take advantage of. A cell is located by its X and Y position within the grid, which are not the actual X and Y positions in pixels in the layout for the object's instance. Then we project this grid to render the scene to isometric perspective. In the end, we simply have a different layer on which we use a different set of isometric graphics to reproduce and display the grid we work with. Thanks to certain math formulas and a clear organization, we can do this projection quite easily. We will handle the actual movement display from a cell to another directly in the projection layer with the appropriate character's dimensions and speed so that it makes sense. So to render a terrain, we start with creating a grid in the tile layer. Four layers in my project. Background, the tile layer in which the tile objects tile obstacle, tile player and tile enemy will go on, the projection layer where I will be using land, land obstacle, proj enemy and proj player, finally a HUD that contains the text and used to contain some text area for debug that I've since removed. The tile obstacle objects will be added over tiles objects to represent the tiles that are going to have an obstacle on top of them. Each tile has its own coordinate within the grid, Tx and Ty. For example, the very first tile in the top left corner is going to be x0 and y0. The tile instance on its right is going to be of coordinates x1, y0 and so on. The x and y 
here are not pixels but cells or tile instances and allow us to logically know where a tile instance is placed within the grid and in relation to the other tile instances. The animation frame to display is also set up with a percentage chance that one frame is displayed over the other. The ratio is 7 on 10 times the animation frame 0 will be displayed. 3 on 10 it is going to be frame 1. In our project event sheet the function create map kicks in. It does place the basic tiles according to the dimensions map width and map height which are global variables there. And the function create obstacles, which is next, that loops through those tiles instances to add tile obstacle on top of them. This is again only the grid creation process. We are still in the tile layer and this is a basic grid with basic elements. This random generation can actually be bypassed if you choose to create your own layer and place the instances yourself. See the comments within the file for further information on that point. This can have the added bonus of allowing you to remove some events to free some space in the free edition. In the code, you can notice more functions following, but they will be to add characters, which we will see in a different video. For now, let's focus on the terrain rendering itself. Once our grid is complete, we call the function create projection that will add the role of creating the isometric projection in the layer projection out of our grid. From now on, we will be creating instances of the land object and displaying the same animation frame as the one displayed in the tile instance we will be projecting. The land object contains as many frames as the tile object, is to say two. Notice also that the graphics used are Kenny NL assets. Lens do have a visible space. I've used the global variable land effective width and land effective height to mention about this, but you can see it is the visible part of the tile. Depending on the art itself, if your tile only displays the efficient space, consider the regular width to be the effective width and same for the height. The lens tiles also have their origin points set about the middle of the visible terrain, as you can notice there, and applied the same to all the animation frames. This is important for the placement of lens, obstacles and characters. Changing the isometric tiles size, so the land there or land obstacles and even the projection after one requires to modify the land effective width and land effective height values that allows to have a proper terrain render. Moreover, you can see that the layout size has to be set manually before the game in the layout properties itself and can be calculated according to land effective width, the map width and possibly also the land object or instance size itself. Back to create projection. The function loops through the existing tiles in the tile layer one by one and creates a land instance in relation to the tile instance. Notice we add instance variable values which are also the logical coordinate of the land within the grid using LX and LY now instead of TX and TY because it is a land, not a tile. Just a personal preference to know what object we are dealing with. We take half of the layout as a reference point as to where to place the land instances on the x-axis, this time the regular x position in pixels. The function then loops again through the tile instances and this tile determines which one are overlapped with an obstacle on top of them. Those obstacles are created in our projection layer as well using the land obstacle object. Notice how the origin point of this object is rather situated at its bottom. Knowing it is being created 
on top of an existing land instance and placed at the very same position the X and Y origin point of the land instance is, it makes sense to have the origin point of the obstacle situated to its bottom to give the impression the object is resting upon the land. To pick what land instance is supposed to receive the land obstacle, notice we pick it thanks to its logical coordinates within the grid. Once obstacles are created, we go to create your projections for the characters. Again, we skip it for now. Just notice in the position characters projection start function, once characters are spawned, we go on and call a few functions to finish up. One of them is set scroll, which purpose is to allow the screen to display a specific place for the render terrain. Notice set scroll actually calls set view. This function uses the scroll x and scroll y system expressions and actions to display position. By default, it will center the camera around the main character. It could be possible to focus only around a specific land instance instead by picking it thanks to its LX and LY values, logical coordinates within the grid, and set scroll X and scroll Y values to the actual land X and land Y pixel positions. When executing our project, we now have two layers representing the same grid, but in very different format. One is a regular grid, the other is an isometric projection. Pressing the V key on the keyboard, we can change the view. The default view, value of 0, displays the tile layer and the projection layer as well. The camera focuses on nothing specific, and you can use the arrow keys to move around the layout. When view equal to 1, we only show the layer grid, the camera focuses on the object tile player, which represents the main character. When view equal 2, we only show the projection layer, the camera focuses on the object approach player, which represents the main character and follows it when it moves around. This is likely the view you would use in your regular game. The arrow keys allow us to move around and are handled in the very simple events 22 to 25. Each direction adds or removes pixels to the scroll X and scroll Y system expressions, allowing to control and move the camera all over the layout. To sum up, we have a grid in a specific layer and use it to render an isometric view projection in a different layer using dedicated isometric sprites and only display this layer to the player. That is it for this part. We can render a terrain and move around it according to a grid we have set up. In the next video, we will focus on having characters and controlling them in the grid and in the isometric projection. I hope you have enjoyed this video. Don't hesitate to check out some of the other Construct2 Academy material. Thank you for watching.